How many of you are floating right now? <laughs> wow, thank you so much. <sighs> Try to do this after that. Wow. Today's talk is what is healing? And as this was coming up, I'm like, really? Really? And you'll know why in a minute. It's, um, it was a, a, a deep core thing. Um, you know, part of it, you know, <clears throat> loneliness around the holidays is a very serious thing for a lot of people. And uh, I remember my first year after being in a family unit for a long time, going through the holiday season single, <clears throat> and it was quite difficult, very painful, awkward. Um, I remember um, being around a lot of people, but they weren't my people. It wasn't my family of it wasn't my family or my family of choice. I didn't yet have a family of choice, if you know what I mean. Years later, I you know, was in a, a, an ACA 12-step group, and we became a family. And I remember when I graduated ceremony and was moving out to San Diego, and they had a big party for me, you know, and we just, we were a family. We were so tight. And um, so to be able to have a family of choice in the holidays is a great gift. And um, we did Thanksgiving that the ladies' group helped sponsor on, on Thanksgiving Day. And there was close to 70 people here. It was amazing. And it was a beautiful family of choice. So it's, we're de we showed up a little late. We missed the opening. And, uh, but next year, we're going early. <laughs> it was fabulous. There was so much love in the room. So if you ever find yourself, reach out to your family of choice. This community is full of loving wonderful people that will help you and support you. Amen? Amen. So, part of, of when we go through any kind of a change, the ego really resists change. The ego believes that change means death. And so it'll resist change. Inherently beneath every fear is the fear of death at the bottom. And so if we can just dive right down to the bottom and get over our fear of death, we're done. <laughs> Piece of cake. But there's so many little things, even graduating from one zip code to another in consciousness as we move, sometimes we miss the playing field of where we were. Um, oh, okay, I'll say it now. Um, I had a dream this morning of a, of a dear friend that uh, had just recently transitioned and um, had the opportunity to talk to him just days before he transitioned. He didn't even know he was about to transition. And um, it was a sweet conversation. But this morning, I had this very vivid dream of hanging out with my buddy again. And it was just so cool. And I remember at some point in the dream, dude, you just transitioned. And then I really noticed his appearance. And he was much younger than I had remembered him. And it was all of his rough edges had smoothed. And it was like his essence, you know, his potential. And it was, it was just a delightful experience of knowing that, hey, when we slip out of the body, we're not, it's not over. We're still living, very much living, and free from a lot of the gravitational pulls that would hold us back, free of that ego gravity that would um, draw us down. But in this process, you know, the, the stages of Greece, the uh, Greece, Grief, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross made famous, you know, the denial, the anger, the bargaining, uh, the depression, and then acceptance. Um, we go through that many times in our life, and it's not a linear progression. All right, I'm in depression, so now I'm almost to acceptance, you know. <laughs> it's not that. It vacillates back and forth, you know, the bargaining to the anger to the denial again, and then all the way back through it again. We can go... Um, through this for a long time. But until we're finally at acceptance, there's this wrestling match. Because the head says, this shouldn't be. And the heart is torn away from the mind at that point. When there's a conflict of our core beliefs and our subjective experience. And it's gut-wrenching. We all know that. We've all been there at different times in our life. And some of us are in that season right now. And so in, in, in light of this, you know, 
I guess, that this talk was born. It, it started when I was reading, you know, Lance did um, this book, um, Who Dies, and um, gave me a copy of it, and I was reading it, and it's a fabulous book. And I've got some quotes here from the author, Stephen Levine. He was a hospice chaplain for years. And I'll, I'll, I'll pick up the importance of hospice chaplains um, that have ministered to me without them maybe knowing about it. Years ago, I was in the Philippines, I was doing my missionary thing, and I was down in the southern part of this island called Palawan. And um, I had to look it up even. I had forgotten the name of it, Rio Tuba. Rio Tuba was this mining community, nickel mining community, owned, owned by a Japanese company. And um, the Japanese, you know, they're very organized and structured. And this town, as we were driving in on this bus, this town was spiffy. You know, the small homes at the edge of town, and then the homes got a little bigger as you got up the seniority scale, and then management houses were bigger and nicer. And then the town center was just impeccably new, beautiful, pristine, everything was really cool. So my buddy and I had met this, this real Pentecostal brother, and he had this healing ministry, and we met somewhere in the provincial capital, and he invited us to go on this journey with him to Rio Tuba. And so we said, okay, and he was a, you know, he had this healing ministry, and so thousands of people would come out to have this guy pray for him. And so we're at this meeting, and it was like a big, huge college field house, big gymnasium, thousands of people there. The whole town was there. And um, they had emptied the hospital. You know, they had all these people in wheelchairs, just, you know, one guy to be prayed for by missionaries. He wasn't talking. And, um, but there was this, one young man, he was in a wheelchair, and he wanted me to pray for him, and there was, uh, he's like 40 years old, and he had black lung. He was dying, and when we prayed, there was a knowingness from both of us that, you know, his time in the body was just about over, and that's not the experience he wanted, and it, it bothered me for years, but we had that look, that exchange look, and it was like, there was a knowingness that his healing was, was going to be of the heart, not a physical healing, but to reconnect the mind and the heart so that he could come to a place of acceptance. That, that experience stayed with me for many years. Years later, years later when I, I got into unity, um, I was truth shopping. You know, I went through the whole spectrum of Christianity just looking for more truth. I could never accept that this perfect person who'd never heard of Jesus Christ was going to hell when he was a loving, gracious, family man, community man, or, or woman. You know, I could never accept eternal damnation just because they had never known Jesus Christ. I believe there are many pathways to truth. And so having been a missionary and seeing this with my Pentecostal brothers that were avid, you know, there's only one way. And I believe when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, he was speaking not from Jesus, but he was speaking pure Christ consciousness. When Moses was enlightened, when he said, I am that I am, he was speaking of the divine, of just a clear window of the divine. It's that same spirit in each of us that is eternal. That there's a dissonance between the mind and this eternal presence within us. And as we bring that together, then I believe there is the healing. So I, I meet this, this unity minister. I found out several years later, she was Robert Brummett's girlfriend for years. And could you imagine a female Robert Brummett? <laughs> so she was the first unity minister that I really resonated with, and I just like, I, oh wow, this, she had this presence. Well, her day job was a hospice chaplain, and she had that presence that she was unshakable, unflappable. No matter what she was going through, she was always present in the presence. You know what I mean? Stuff didn't rile her. She didn't get upset. She didn't have her favorites. She was a very advanced student of truth, I'll say. And so it, it always, every time I meet a, a, a hospice chaplain, and the gentleman that's, 
that um, taken over the church I came from, that was his vocation for years. And when he walks by, you just feel love walk by, you know, that presence. So anyhow, I, I'm reading this book and I'm loving it because Stephen Levine is a, is a hospice chaplain, many years experience. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is one of his mentors. And he shared some quotes. I'm going to share some quotes from his book. He says, the balance of the mind and the heart is reflected in the body. When the heart and the mind are not in harmony, there sometimes occurs what we call disease. Disease. He goes on, but I suspect this is not the only cause of illness because many saintly beings have died of cancer. Ramana Maharshi, Suzuki Roshi, Ramakrishna, clearly saints, amazing souls. So later on he says, cancer is the gift for the person that has everything. Because many people wake up when they get a serious disease. All of a sudden they're very serious. And so a lot of the, the little things that upset us, there's like these embers and sometimes we can go into a full rage and anger, fire. It's these embers, I believe, after reading Anita Morjani's book, where she did all the right things. She ate all the right foods. You know, she did all the right stuff, but she still had this fear beneath her that was burning. And when her friend and in-law, brother-in-law, I think, got cancer, she was mortally afraid with can of cancer, and she just, it was on her mind 24-7. No, no, cancer. Oh, no, cancer. Well, she ends up manifesting cancer in her body with all the fear and all this obsession. She goes on to say that the mind is a powerful creator. So let's focus it where we want it to go. But she did all the right things. But in the end, in her near-death experience, when she was right there, and she just surrendered all fear, all fear of death, was washed away, and then she was physically healed. So Stephen Levine breaks it down. Healing is when the heart and the mind come back into balance. When this harmony is restored, we say that someone is healed. And that is an elegant and simple definition of healing, and I really like it. I've added a few things to it, and we'll close with that. But he has said that I have only known, or I have known a few who fought their disease tooth and nail, and only when they prepared to die did their heart and mind come into balance and manifest a physical healing. So there's this component of surrender that shows up. And what are we surrendering to? Are we surrendering to the chatter of thinking this? No. No. I loved your opening prayer, Tammy, where you talked about gratitude because gratitude is like the microwave to get us out of a, of a chuck hole. You know, when we're in a really a bad place, just sit down and start thinking of the people in your life, the things in your life, the people you love, and just feel that in your heart. Just focus on that and you will, you'll be lifted not with this, but with this. When this heart and this soul come together in gratitude. It's a very powerful experience. Gratitude is at the energy level, uh, just about an unconditional love. And an unconditional love is where miracles begin, where healing really takes place. Amen? So that's a great practice. We want to hold on to that. Hmm. So he goes on to say, death is not the enemy. The enemy is ignorance and lovelessness. Withholding love is the, I think, probably the biggest cause of dissonance separating the mind and the heart. Because we hang on to resentments up here. That son of a gun. And we can justify it all day long, can't we? Well, da, 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 da. We can go through all the reasons, and yet we've removed ourselves from the experience of love. 
The experience of the presence of God is everywhere, all the time. It's available, but it's by choice. If we're hanging on to resentments, we've displaced ourselves from the opportunity to experience God. Does that make sense? If there's any resentment we're holding on to, we're pushing ourselves out of a heavenly experience. You know, anger feels really empowering. You get a lot of juice, a lot of adrenaline, but people that live in anger are only happy about 12% of the time. Not where we want to hang out. We want to let that go. Get back into our gratitude. Think of love. You know, I, I did this practice. I got cut off once in Lee Summit uh, on the freeway there. And uh, I just thought, well, wait a minute. Why am I going to be resentful towards this person that's clearly got to be somewhere in a hurry? And I began to imagine, what if that was my partner? What if that was my partner going somewhere important? How would I feel? Totally shifted my paradigm. Got me out of this and put me in here. And enabled me to have compassion for whatever journey that soul was on without judgment. I could just bless them and step out of the way. And it's pride that would negate stepping out of the way to allow something to go. You know, the last shall be first. First to what? First to joy? First to happiness? First to peace? Letting go. All that junk we don't need. So, we also hosted these meetings in, in San Diego called the Death Cafe, where people would just talk about death. We had all these little, you know, questions to open mixers, you know, to just talk about this thing we don't want to talk about. And um, it, it's uncomfortable. But when you talk about it, it takes the spook out of it, and you just relax. It's just the body. We can't die. We just let it go and trade it in on a new one. It's simple. It's like going to the car dealership. <laughs> mm. Ramana Maharshi said something in uh, one of the chapters in there that I, I really love, and he's a great teacher. Somebody was asking about the fear of death. And he said, if a man, and this is, you know, he transitioned in 1950, so forgive the, the English, non-gender specific. But if a man considers he is born, he cannot avoid the fear of death. Let him find out if he has been born or if the big S self has any birth. Now, you, all y'all know, all y'all know, when you read a spiritual text, especially anybody from the East, the capital S self is basically the what Christians would call the Holy Spirit within. That eternal, never-ending, never-dying part that isn't rattled by emotions, it's not emotional, it's just love and peace and power. And it isn't moved, it doesn't get pushed emotionally, it can't be triggered. It's that stillness, that place we, we go to. Okay, so let him find out if he has been born or if the self has any birth. He will discover that the self always exists. That the body which is born resolves itself into thought. And that the emergence of thought is the root of all mischief. So along with the body comes the ego. The ego and our karma is one and the same. It's what what we are thus far. If there was a final exam, it's where we are to date. It's not a heavy thing, it's just who we are. It's what we are. So we sit and we find from where thoughts emerge. And when we can differentiate what's coming from the chatter up here to the stillness down here. We can identify the character, nature, difference of the stillness and the chatter, amen? So then, once we know where source is coming from, then we will abide in the ever-present inmost self and be free from the idea of birth or the fear of death. So why do we fear death? I think it's because if we believe that life 
began the moment we were born, wow, there's suffering. Suffering is when, you know, we cling on to something that shouldn't be. That's the be beginning of suffering. It shouldn't be this way. But if we think that we're just a body and that we're going to be in the dirt, there's a world of suffering going on there. There's hopelessness. Having been a, an atheist, it's hopeless. It's just that you just assume that's it. It's over. Vacuum. Nothing. But so... I heard this metaphor in the book also about this, this river that's moving along and then it goes over a waterfall. And if you notice, if it's a very long drop of a waterfall, the water droplets all separate. So we have this experience of being separate because we're not experiencing the sea of Christ right now. This infinite ocean that connects us all, that we're all connected, we're all of the same spirit. We share the same spirit but we see these outcroppings dressed differently. And we assume that, that there's separation. But at the end of the waterfall, we all come back together again. And we experience, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just a nightmare, the separation. We're all together again. I love that metaphor. So in Jeremiah 1.5, for our, our Christian roots out here, uh, the... The, the Father, the Holy Spirit, is speaking to Jeremiah, the prophet. Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So if life began at the moment of birth, how could God have already known this spirit? I think I'm speaking to the choir here. It's, there's no question that we're an eternal being, right? Is anybody, if anybody questions that, stick around. We'll talk, okay? <laughs> so we have these karmic agreements, and we have divine callings. We have callings. You know, it's amazing. The people in our lives, you know, I believe that we have a karmic agreement to work together, to get through this life with, to have an ally, to do our practices with, our spiritual practices, to evolve and to move on to not be satisfied with the status quo. So I believe true healing is this. To lose all fear of death. That our ego comes into harmony with the spirit. Or better yet, that we surrender the ego entirely and there's just spirit remaining. Amen? It's oneness, non-duality, enlightenment. That's the path we're on, folks. To fully, to be fully present in the presence no matter what. And to never, ever, ever withhold love. Doesn't matter if something's going on and you're angry about something, never let go of the love. Never allow our love to be conditional. We can be frustrated and we can be angry, but we love the people we're talking to. We don't want to permanently injure another soul. Make sense? So we never, ever, ever withhold love because I really believe that suffering also begins the moment we withhold love. We're stopping the divine flow of God that would want to go through us and to touch every soul that we encounter. And we talked about the healing of Peter's shadow last week, just to be in the aura, how healing it was to be in the presence of, of somebody that's enlightened. So God bless you all. In this place of total equanimity, no matter what's going on in the world around, there's complete stillness within. There's no more pushing. There's no more pulling. There's no more grasping. There's absolute serenity and peace. No matter what else is going on, there's only love. That's all we're here for. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you like the message, we invite you to like it or share it. And uh, we also want to let you know that we're on Instagram, Twitter, and we'll see you again next Sunday on Facebook at 1125. We're a New Thought Church where lives are transformed. And we welcome you to check us out. Check out our website, unityhills.org. We'll see you next week. Namaste. Namaste.